If I step on the scale, I come in at 187 pounds and 69 inches tall. If we convert that to metric, then divide my weight by my height squared, we get about 27.5. This is what's called my body mass index, or BMI, and it's the main way American health professionals define obesity. My BMI of 27.5 puts me right in the middle of the overweight category. These BMI tables are everywhere in health and medical settings here in the United States, which gives us the idea that a low BMI is like the holy grail of health. But of course, nothing is ever that simple. Obesity can for sure put you at a risk of chronic health conditions. I'm not arguing the opposite. But BMI isn't a direct measure of body fat. It's only a stand-in. And when you compare it to other predictors of obesity, like waist circumference, or to measures of physiology, like cholesterol, a high BMI isn't the most accurate way of predicting your risk for disease. Plus, it's not equitable. A BMI of 24 is no cause for concern in white people, but points to a higher risk of diabetes for South Asians. In short, the body mass index is a broken system. So I had two questions going into this video. How did the BMI become such a big part of our healthcare system, and is it actually useful in modern day? Our story starts in early 19th century Europe with a real Renaissance man. His name was Adolphe Quetelet, a Belgian scientist interested in astronomy, math, and sociology, but not medicine. He was more interested in probability and statistics, and when he was young, he moved to Paris and studied under math legends like Laplace and Fourier. And when he came back to Belgium, his whole jam was integrating statistics into other sciences, like astronomy. And eventually, he wondered if he could apply statistics to the social sciences to understand complex phenomena like crime, suicide, or marriage rates. He published a bunch of work, but his most famous work was Treatise on Man, published in 1835, where he described his concept of the average man. In it, he proposed that human traits were measurable, and they'd have some degree of variability which fell along a normal bell curve. This was the start of the field of anthropometry, measuring data about the human body. And with this data, you could, in theory, find l'homme moyen, or the average man. But how do you find an average weight? Taller people usually weighed more, so Ketelet proposed that average weight should be contextualized alongside height with a simple equation. Mass in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. He called it the Ketelet Index, and it's what we now call the Body Mass Index, or BMI. But Ketelet's goal was purely mathematical. He wasn't trying to find a predictor of heart disease or mortality. From the beginning, he was looking for a metric that could be used on a broader, population-wide scale. Think less doctor's office, more public health department. But even as a statistical curiosity, he came up short. His BMI data came entirely from French and Scottish participants, which is one of the main critiques we see about the metric today. The data for the average man was based on a few white people, which set the precedent that a white standard was normal and anything else was a deviation. That provided a basis for explicitly bigoted scientists to justify their racism with data a few years later. Especially when imagined alongside Darwin's brand new natural selection theory, academics used measurable information about the human body, like BMI, as rationale that some people shouldn't have kids, which became the pseudoscience of eugenics. So anthropometry and BMI may have started out purely academic, but it was quickly corrupted by racism. Over the years, different scientists would come up with different variations for the BMI equation, like cubing height, or what's called the ponderal index, putting height on top and weight on the bottom. But for the most part, BMI was only used in the world of statistics. Doctors weren't using it in their practices, since they didn't really know if it mattered. The big turning point happened when American insurance companies got involved. Just so we're all on the same page, life insurance is a fund that you pay into while you're alive, and then when you die, the insurance company gives a certain amount of money to your beneficiary. Usually this was your spouse, and it was a way to replace your income. Now, if the insured person lives a long life, the insurance company is happy because they collected hundreds of monthly payments over the years. But if the insured person dies early, the insurance company wouldn't be able to collect as many payments, but they'd still have to pay the same amount out to the beneficiary. So to make up for potential lost costs ahead of time, if someone was deemed more likely to die early, insurance companies would charge them more money. It's the same for car insurance or fire insurance. Riskier cases are charged more money. So the life insurance companies had to figure out what to charge overweight people for insurance, but how? In the early 20th century, life insurance companies started documenting more and more cases of earlier death in highly overweight people. In 1910, an insurance company noticed that 
that the health effects of a high BMI were worse for young people than for the elderly. That meant fewer monthly payments in the long run for overweight folks, so BMI emerged as a predictor of early death. But just like Ketelet decades before them, their data was wonky. Insurance companies only included BMI data from people who had the funds and legal ability to buy insurance. So once again, we got way more data from white, affluent Americans since we were still talking about pre-World War II America. Now, selection bias aside, height and weight were usually self-reported by the insured person, which also raises accuracy issues, and even more, no two insurance companies used the data in the same way. Some factored in age, while others didn't. Now, people like to point out that these investigations were done by actuaries. Insurance statisticians, basically, not doctors. And for this purpose, that was the appropriate expert to use, someone to compile data and estimate risk. Medical professionals were just starting to learn why obesity was leading to all these early deaths from a biological perspective. And over the next few decades, we learn way more about the mechanism behind these pathologies. For example, we only learned how diabetes worked physiologically in the 1920s, thanks to these two. And we didn't document an increased risk from obesity until 1935. And then we didn't really start learning about the biology of obesity itself until the 1960s. So in the meantime, doctors were stuck using data from life insurance companies to understand the risk of obesity. But all this time, we'd assumed that BMI was an accurate measure of body fat. We hadn't tested that assumption. So in 1972, a research group led by Ansel Keys publicly called out that assumption and asked, is BMI actually a good way of predicting someone's level of fat? Keyes started the paper at square one, acknowledging that BMI tables come from life insurance companies, which gives us a skewed idea of what average really means. He then goes on to say that BMI probably doesn't predict obesity unless you're way overweight. And in the conclusion, he also noted that Ketelet never said his index predicted adiposity, or body fat. So in his study, he looked at previously recorded data from over 7,400 healthy men from five countries. This table shows where the participants came from. It's linked along with all my other sources in the description if you want to check it out. Now, interestingly, they looked at a small sample of Bantu men from South Africa, but admittedly, this sample wasn't represented representative of other Bantu men, and the paper never says why. For all the participants, the researchers looked at height and weight, as well as body density using underwater weighing, which is something that's much more involved but more accurate. Then they compared different calculations, including a simple weight over height, the ponderal index, and the traditional BMI. In the end, they concluded that BMI was the best of these equations for predicting body fat, and they recommended using it instead of the other equations for population-level studies. And Keyes would later go on to use BMI to come up with with this U-shaped graph. It shows how your risk of early death increases exponentially with underweight and with increasing obesity. So by the 1970s, BMI was used by life insurance companies to predict early death, and it was validated as a good predictor of body fat, although again, with a mostly white sample. And following Key's study, BMI became more relevant in the public health setting. Enter the World Health Organization. In the 1980s, the WHO published those familiar cutoff values for weight categories that we use today, and in 1998, the United States NIH and CDC followed suit. Now, funnily enough, the United States had been using a BMI of 27.8 as the lower threshold for overweight, but by adopting the WHO cutoffs, overweight now started at a BMI of 25, so overnight, about 29 million Americans went from normal to overweight. Unfortunately, we soon found out that these categories weren't one-size-fits-all. The WHO noticed that people of Asian descent saw an increased risk of chronic health conditions starting at lower BMI ranges than Europeans. And at the same time, they also noticed a trend that BMI underestimated body fat percentage in Asians compared to Europeans. So you could have a group of Thai people and Italian people, but the Italians would have less body fat and a smaller risk of diabetes compared to the Thais of the same BMI. To reflect these findings, some countries published their own BMI categories, like Singapore did in 2005. This oversight stems from the same bias that Ketelet held almost 200 years ago. Researchers have way more data from white, affluent people than they do for people of color. And studies that have come out in the last decade show the same phenomenon that the WHO documented in the late 90s. Risk factors of heart disease are more common at lower BMIs in black, Hispanic, and Asian populations than in white people. And that might lead some people, both patients and doctors, to avoid looking at other risk factors since, hey, you're normal weight, 
nothing to worry about, right? Now, some researchers have proposed BMI cutoffs specific to race, while others say that it's a waste of time, and plenty of doctors and researchers have suggested defining obesity based on how the body is working rather than how much it weighs. But ultimately, we find ourselves going in circles. What's convenient isn't as accurate, which isn't as convenient, and so on. So why do we still use the BMI? Well, it is useful to see larger trends across population, like the obesity epidemic in America. It's unlikely that we'll get the time and resources to measure everyone's body fat all the time, but BMI gives us at least a ballpark number to work with. So while healthcare professionals and researchers know that BMI is imperfect and problematic at the individual level, it's the most convenient and popular metric for estimating obesity at the public health level. And until a public health agency, whether it's the WHO, CDC, or some other organization recommends some other metric, we're stuck with the BMI for now. Thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon for making this video happen. This is a topic I've wanted to explore for a while, and the financial support on Patreon frees me up to make videos like these. If you want to help support my channel and help fund videos, you can do so with the link in the description. Thanks for watching.